Well, I think in general that most people don't recognize how big it actually will become. You know, they're thinking it's like, a, you know, electric car, it's a big change, you know, or the mobile phone, or um, it's hard to imagine. But I think that the people generally are not recognizing how in 10 years, you know, how big the change will be and what becomes possible. And, and also in good ways, you know, many people don't believe that we can have, we can live without oil. Yeah. And it's it's a certainty that we don't need oil in 15 years. Yeah? I mean, we, we need for small things, but not for energy. Yeah? So yeah, it's I think it's hard to imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think that the rule of technology really is. Uh, I think somebody else mentioned the other day. It's like in the in the, in Hemingway's book, he talks he talks to a man and he, and he asks, "How do people go bankrupt?" And the guy says, "Gradually, then suddenly. You know, first very slowly, and then very quickly." And the rule of technology is exponential, which we are not. You know, we are. So you grow a beard; your beard will be in four weeks a little bit longer. It will not be like this. You know, so we are linear. Right? It's not like you can switch on the beard the next day you have a beard. You know, so technology is completely different because you don't see anything for a long time because it has to come together. You know, and then when it comes together, it goes just like Spotify. Right? So it was tried for twenty years. Naps didn't work. And all of a sudden, Spotify got the money, they got the labels, and here we are, five years later, 100 million subscribers. Yeah? Five years from now, one billion subscribers. Yeah. And that's what technology does. So we have to think exponentially. If you're a doctor, today it's very difficult to get a robot to give you oncology report. It's working, but in 10 years, it'll be like making a WhatsApp phone call. You know? It's hard to imagine. So we have to think gradually, then suddenly. Oh, well, the millennials in general are in a difficult place because they, they know the old world. They know, for example, what offline is. The kids don't know what offline is. Yeah? Uh, and, and they think that anything is possible, but they, they don't feel motivated to really do very much. Yeah? So it's, it's the most difficult generation. For the 15-year-olds, the kids, the, the Generation Z, you know, for them the whole world is connected and it's completely normal. Yeah? Uh, but I think in 10 years, it'll be people like us who will still remember what it was like to not have the internet. Because it will be like air, like water, like breathing. Yeah. So for media, it's basically going all over the top. Even if over the top means satellite or cable, it'll all be IP networks. Yeah. Because I have the unlimited bandwidth of, of having whatever program in parallel. Right? So, for example, voice control. Yeah. Uh, today, if you're an 80-year-old woman, you can't really read the newspaper very well, you can't use the remote control, you can't use the app. You know, in, uh, in just a few years, you just sit on the couch and you say you want to see Kojak, you know, 1986. And, you know, that already works. But think about that for a second, because if you can control television with your voice, and it's all available for 20 euros, that, that everything will change. There's several things about this. First, the big companies still have a very big distribution advantage. So they can buy the fast internet, they can, they can go through satellite, they can th go through cable, and they can go through internet, which is a big advantage today. You know? So th they are still very strong on distribution. So that's still a big advantage. And then production costs for really good video hasn't really gone down th that much. It has, I mean, this, yes, but... You know, we make professional films, and it's 100,000 euros, and it, okay, it used to be 500,000, but, you know, it's not 10,000. Yeah. So, music is different. M music production is really cheap. Right? But, so, television, I think, to a large degree, big companies will have a chance, but the biggest problem is public TV. Uh, we have to allow public TV to go on the internet and compete, like everybody else, otherwise public TV is useless, because you know, that's all we're going to have, right? Uh, so the idea that we keep public TV just on the regular networks is crazy. Yeah? We're moving into a world of niches, right? So whatever your niche is, if you're into dance music, then you can watch the Goa Trans channel on, on MTV or whatever, but it's all in niches. Yeah? It's, it's not mass markets anymore. So in, uh, 20 years ago, we had Elton John, the Rolling Stones in music. And what do we have today? Today we have you know, some underground band from Lisbon that everybody knows here, but nobody else knows it, 
because it's on the internet, you know, it's, it's uh, and you have a channel like uh, Gamma Sutra, you know, gaming channel on YouTube, has six billion views a month. Most people don't know what it is. So, and this is the fragmentation of society, a fragmentation of media. Well, I think the problem with uh, newspapers is that they have the distribution, so if you wanted to advertise, you have to go through them 20 years ago. And if one, people want the local news, they have to read that. And mm -hmm. it was limited supply. Yeah? Now, with the internet, it's unlimited supply. So their problem is that they had a monopoly of attention. Yeah? And even if there was just really bad stuff in the newspaper, they would still print the newspaper and would have monopoly. And today, if you want advertising, if you want to buy things, you go to Amazon. You don't go to the newspaper. Uh, and if you want dating, you go to Tinder, and you know you don't go to the newspaper. So they, they have lost their business case. You know they they have they have lost their reason to exist. Uh, uh, and so the good papers like Vanguardia and, and Spain and you know the ones that are making that transition, they have to find a new case. You know, and what is their case? The Washington Post has found a new case. Uh, the Guardian has a new case. The Economist has a new case. Atlantic has a new case. You have to find a new business case. And if, if it's local media, then you have to make sure that you are unique, you know? And the successful media companies today, they don't just do newspapers, they do television, radio, events, conferences, uh, online distribution, business advice, business analytics. I think this, uh, this South African company called uh, uh, Naspers, it's a big uh, media company, 60% of their revenues are not media. They are, they, are, they are like business advice for clients and so it's converging, huh? and I think the window of saying that you are the only possibility to reach people, the window is closing, huh? except for very few big brands like the Wall Street Journal, uh, where you can chart on New York Times, you know that. But you know, a local paper is not the New York Times, so so it's completely different mechanics. the The rule of digital Darwinism, right? Digital survival is that if you are dispensable, you will be dispensed. Yeah? And that, I see that all the time, even my own work. You know, if people can do without me because it's not unique enough, they will. Yeah. Because they, they find a workaround. Uh, in fact, many conferences don't book me because they can watch my YouTube. You have to ask yourself if you're dispensable. Uh, and this is, you know, the record labels are dispensable now, for example. And they haven't noticed yet. The only thing they have is the copyrights of the old songs. You know, but if you're a musician today, do you go to a record label? Not to those record labels, maybe to a small label, or like a co-op, or like a marketing label, like, like Motor Music in Germany or so. Uh, you don't need those guys because it was all about distribution, and distribution is solved. Huh? So you haven't found out that you're, you, know, you, you basically don't have a position anymore. And, and so this is something that the car companies have found out. Uh, if Mercedes-Benz and Audi and BMW don't become mobility providers, People will say, I don't need a car, so that's it, BMW, gone, yeah? just gone. And you don't realize because it's very slow and then all of a sudden it's a mass movement. Yeah? First, uh, media is a, is a human activity, okay? Uh, because media is about storytelling, it's about interpretation, it's about images, it's about improvisation, it's about mystery, it's about all of those things. Media is not a, media is not a machine. Yeah? So what has happened because of social media is that media has become a machine, an algorithm. So Facebook is an AI that takes media, takes us, puts us back inside and sells to the advertisers. And that makes a lot of money because it's so simple. You know, it's, it's just tech and people are expensive. So if we want media to be human again, we have to rehumanize media. We have to force those companies to hire people we have to force support of existing media organizations. We have, we have to allow public TV, public radio to go on the internet. Uh, we have to increase funding for all the public activities of media because they're part of democracy. I mean, it can't be that Facebook is making literally trillions of dollars and everybody else is bleeding because they built the perfect machine. But they build a machine that nobody is happy with. Because, you know, what they're doing is not a machine. I mean, relationships, friendship, media, is, they're not machines, they're human. So if we want to keep what makes us human, we have to invest. Because, you know, we can't always go to the cheapest possible way of doing things. Uh, because if we do that, we are, we're, it's, a, it's going to the 
running to the bottom of the pile, you know, as, as cheap and as fast as possible. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these companies have become cartels, just like energy or, or the rubber barons or oil companies. And not so much because they designed it in such way, because of their own dynamics, you know. It's uh, when you're really innovative, then you, you keep this up, you get bigger, you get this big, you know. You don't just grow like this, you grow like this, you know? <laughs> like Alibaba. You know? And I think it's time for those companies to self-regulate. Uh, Facebook is, is starting a center for journalism, you know, for $300 million. That's, of course, very little, right? But, okay, so self-regulate, they have to be regulated, they have to be subject to social expectations. Uh, we have to redo the tax system. We have to do all these things because these companies are more powerful than Shell or ExxonMobil or... They're not evil, but they're evil as a consequence of unintended action. You know, not because they're sitting down saying, let's kill those poor journalists, you know. Yeah, this is just a side effect. You know, but I mean, every company is, is responsible for the side effects that they create. Right? Especially when it's a tech company. Right? The difficulty is what does the market need uh, this week, in the five years, and in ten years, because they're different things. You know, right now people need programmers, data scientists, you know, because the machines are not are, are too stupid to do it. Yeah? So a telecom engineer today finds work in ten years. No, right? because in 10 years, engineering a telecom network will be automated. Right? Because the machines will learn it. I mean, this is just a question of time. So what do you need in 10 years? You need somebody who designs the machines that will build the telecom network, or who is an AI human interface designer. You need the next level, right? So we have to educate, you know, every couple of years we have to think about what is the next wave of what we need. And this idea that you would have technical skills and then you, you certainly have a job, that's just ridiculous. Yeah? Um, I think we need to have a huge investment in science and invention, but we also need investment in uh, the human, humanities, you know, art, culture, philosophy, uh, because in the end this is the only thing that machines can't do. Machines will even do the science for us. A lot of the learning and teaching will not uh, stop when you get out of school, because Teaching and learning will be a lifelong activity. Yes. So we have to also have programs for 30-year-old people who are saying, you know, uh, my, my job as a programmer is ending and I, I want to do interface design or I want to do something and they have to be able to go somewhere. So I think it would be ideal to have six-month courses for anybody who says, okay, I'm going to learn how to do data science. I'm going to learn how to, how to, do, uh, how to understand AI. I'm going to write a book or whatever it is. You know, six months and the government should pay for six months every couple of years to get on to the next thing, you know? In Finland, this is already happening, you know, because they spend lots of money on education. But what we are doing is we're saying, okay, if you just study the right thing, you'll have a good job, you know? And, and that's completely false, because those jobs don't exist anymore. We have to make our job, right? I mean, we're, we're freelancers. We work, we make our job every week. We make a new piece of our job, and we keep mutating, you know? Uh, and that's a skill you have to learn. And then we have to design the social welfare system to cover independent workers and the gig economy. I think eventually we have no choice because it is really the question of the least, the least problems. Yeah? I think if we have, let's say we have 50% unemployment for kids, uh, we have lots of drugs and other problems, we have uh, terrorism because of inequality, you know, then we can say it's a lot cheaper to pay people to do whatever they want to do hopefully good things, uh, than to not pay them. You know? And also, of course, things are going to be in 20 years so cheap to pay, like healthcare, media, telecom, transportation. The state can say, well, you know, the medical services are going to be so cheap in 20 years because technology will make it much easier, like home diagnostics. Right? So the government can say, you know what, food, water, electricity, transportation, paid. Do something. I think the problem is that the, the basic income is fundamentally anti-capitalist in, in, uh, in the sense of that, that the consumption is... So this would, this would provide for sort of a post-capitalism, you know, a, a new form of capitalism. First, I think that the, the word of artificial intelligence is very scary to people because it means Hollywood, ex machina, you know. So I think it's much better to say cognitive machines or intelligent assistance, you know, fancy software, basically, right? 
and everybody likes fancy software. So, so I think that training people in the benefit, I mean, everybody knows the mobile phone has a benefit, uh, and they use apps to buy the ticket, and everybody, does, I mean, the 80-year-old mother does that now, right? Grandmother. So it's a question of making it more affordable, bringing down the price, bringing down the price of access, uh, democratizing, but you know, we should not glorialize, you know, we should not make it a, a sort of a, you know, the more connected you are, the more happy you will be, because that's just not true. You know? I mean, connectivity is a tool like, uh, you know, like, like any other tool that we use to do things. You know, sometimes we don't want to be connected, you know, disconnected to ourselves. You know? So I think the telecoms have done a good job promoting connectivity, the government also, but there is such a thing as overconnected. Right? Yeah, we need a lot more conversation. And uh, we, this shouldn't be an academic topic. To be human is not academic, you know. Uh, to talk about whether the uh, the drone weapon can be automated or not, those are other issues. But you know, being human is a very fundamentalist. I mean, look at ancient Greece. You know, the discussion about what it means, you know, how to achieve happiness, and you know, those are all things that we need to keep in mind because technology will eat them up one by one, just because. That's what it does, you know, it, it grows like this. So before you know it, you'll have a happiness app, you know, that will be monitoring your blood pressure and all this stuff. And, and then you can't, you know, there'll be a day where you get up in the morning and you cannot exist without technology. And I'm not talking about being sick. I'm talking about being a normal person. I'm not talking about cholesterol pills or blood pressure. I'm talking about getting up and saying, you know, where is the network? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that, that, that is not that far away. And this is something we don't want. We want to be able to exist just with us. Yeah.